Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Castlevania Legacy of Darkness playthrough. We are on the last leg of this journey, which means I'm probably going to die about 20, 26 times by the time we get to the uh, end of Leg this. of Darkness. <laughs> the last leg of Legacy I'm, of I'm Darkness. I'm chock full of them. Is that a piece of Dracula we have to collect? Yes. <laughs> the Leg of Darkness. <laughs> and the second one is Leg of Darkness 2. Yeah. You know... I was always a bit baffled by the amount of, of Simon's quest callbacks in later Castlevania games, until more recently when I actually learned a bit about the fucking series and I realized, hey, you know, Simon's quest was actually pretty popular in Japan. It did better than Castlevania 3. Uh, which is unfortunate, because Castlevania 3 not doing very good was kind of a tragic end to an, to an ambitious fucking project. You know what they- There's something- no, no, there's something poetic about that. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to find the words, like for that. Oh, why three wouldn't be as popular as two over in Japan when I think three has the better version in Japan <laughs> than it uh, over here in the West. Same version, same reason actually. Difficulty was the main was the main complaint. Even really? on that. yeah. Oh. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, Castlevania three is hard no matter what, but fuck, like the JP version doesn't repeatedly kick in that cock. Yeah. Anyway, this is the Room of Clocks. Every character comes to this level, but it's different for every character because it's just a boss arena. It is, um, it, it's, it's where you fight your rival character, and I know we just established that, like, last part, but, you know, this is where you're going to fight the, the character who's supposed to be your, your, play, your player character's secondary antagonist besides Dracula. Um, here we're about to fight death. We fight, uh, Lady Dingo Dial over in, in, um, in Carrie's campaign. You'll see what I mean when we get there. And, uh, Cornell fights Ortega, who gets introduced way earlier in the game than any of the other rivals. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, 16-bit death. The only thing I can say for him is that he fares better than Bowser. Um, but, you know... He, he's not as imposing as death tends to be. Say 16-bit? I want to make sure that was deliberate. 16-bit. 64-bit. Sorry. Yeah, you, you said 16-bit. <laughs> I was like, man, even you have to admit. <laughs> yeah, that, that, this death model's not the best. Also, you know, the, the little dinky little flying scythes being the thing that Rosa has to save us from. is it, yeah. it, It's not the most dramatic thing in this graphical style, I'm going to say. But uh, it's nice of death to let us have our emotional farewell. Um, no, it's uh, it's it's in the same time and space bubble as codec conversations. Talking is a free action. <laughs> uh, I, I I do like this scene though. Apart from the fact that Drac that that death is just like letting it happen. Um. I like Reinhardt saying a prayer for Rosa before she fades away. Yeah, this is actually a neat touch. I especially like it in the context of the, the modern series, or the modern Netflix series being very cynical about religion. While at the same time, while, the, while at the same time acknowledging holy power, it's it's very strange. Yeah, actually, and I, and I kind of uh, I kind of like that subtle bit of storytelling. If this was the intent, because uh, she's a vampire, right? Yeah. So. She's holding to the cross and it's not burning her skin, which means that she's been forgiven. Well, she hasn't hold, held it up to her face yet, so you see, it hasn't confused. No matter. It hasn't I think confused I, I, the shit I, out I, of her in brain. The, <laughs> in, in the way, <laughs> trying to make something out of this man. <laughs> uh, actually, there was a there was a there was a YouTube comment argument that I that I poked my nose into the other day about the the about Nocturne having crosses actually have holy power as opposed to just adhering to Trevor's explanation from season four of the last series. And I'm like, you know, both can be true at the same time, guys. You, you, you're overthinking this. <laughs> <laughs> Nocturne's very odd to me. Uh, how so? It just kind of... It's very Castlevania and also very not at the same time to me. It's just kind of weird. Well, it's continuing off the back of the old series, and the old series already, like, spiraled off into the oblivion dimension of canon divergence, like, really hard. Yeah, I think <laughs> I, I, I think it's as good as we were going to... No, I mean, I, I, I sort of half agree. 
uh, and half disagree because I think there are plot beats that left unresolved in the original run that Nocturne just kind of doesn't mention because of the severe time gap. Yeah. Uh, between the end of Trevor's story and the beginning of Richter's. For, for, I, I, if anything, I'd start there. Um, like, And I'm saying someone that loves everything about Rondo of Blood. I love Richter Belmont. He's my favorite. I'm wondering if it was the right decision to go immediately from Trevor to Richter. Well, what is there between Trevor and Richter to, to, to work with? Uh, okay, so uh, Trevor is... Oh, I mean Simon. Simon is after Trevor. Uh, and... True, but... The... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to include all the other Belmonts here. Uh, Juice Belmont, I believe, is he, he's, Simon's. Yeah, he's actually in Nocturne. And he's in Nocturne, yeah. But I think should have showed his story first before going to Nocturne or Richter. Maybe, yeah. You know? I mean, um, okay. I mean, yeah, but at the same time, I don't really see much within his story worth adapting, to be honest. Well, that's what you make. Well, I mean, to be fair, though. The, the Castlevania a, series have already made new things out of the old. Why not just do it again with Juice? I was gonna say if we were gonna if we were gonna say that, then Castlevania three has very little to go off of either. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, but they it, still made it work. It, it's not it's not that. It's that what's there is kind of like weird, like the giant fish that we're seeing flying across. Yeah. It. Well, I was about to ask, <laughs> what the fuck is happening on the screen? Uh, uh, Death summons giant. Magic fish. fish. <laughs> it's yeah. it's strange. There's curses. I was sure the fish would work. I like how he says scum of a Belmont, even though you're not named Belmont. Although this is a good time to bring up that Reinhardt was originally supposed to be named Schneider Belmont. Um and Cornell was supposed to be Cornell Reinhardt. The names just sort of got merged when Cornell got cut from the original game. It's kind of weird, but it Retro, but it, but it but it sort of accidentally fits into the continuity better because we know that during this time there were a bunch of Belmonts who weren't named Belmont. We knew that even when Bloodlines came out, we just didn't know why. I, I gotta be that guy. What the fuck does cocksure mean? Cocksure means arrogant. It's really, uh, I never heard. Pres yeah, presumptuously or arrogantly confident. I've never heard of cocksure before. It's a bit old-fashioned, but it's not that old-fashioned. It's just, you know, not something you'd hear in everyday conversation today. Yeah, because everyone I know just, just will just say arrogant. Yeah, I see it. Well, or, or cocky, which is probably where that word comes that from. That too, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a more old-timey, complete version of that word, I suppose you could say. Anyway, the Clock Tower stage. This is actually worth talking about between the two versions, because in the original version, it was like playing through a couple of badly designed test rooms. <laughs> this level was not good in Vanilla 64. In fact, this room that we're in right now is like the only unchanged room. Oh, I, I barely avoided death there. I didn't know it while I was playing as Reinhardt, but if you get oh, you already killed, You already <laughs> killed death. Oh, uh, well... well yeah, I, I, I mean, I didn't know it when I was actually recording Reinhardt's run yet because it hadn't happened to me. But if you step into the space between two conveyor belts or two clock gears, it will crush you and you will die. It's the only time. Oh, okay. It's the only time crushing death is actual is actually instant death in this game. It's weird. Um, but okay, so this room was basically unchanged between the two bet between the two versions of the game. It is the only room that was basically unchanged between the two versions of the game. And even here, like, the camera would be fixed for this entire walk across the platform. It would force you to do this side-scrolling with Medusa heads coming after you, and it would be fucking annoying. Mm. But, like, in general, the original version of Clock Tower just played like a beta level, right? It had fixed cameras up the wazoo everywhere, the placement of this fucking key that I'm going after was a lot more annoying than it is in the final game. And um, and and more importantly, you would play through three rooms that all had heavy fixed pl camera platforming, and then the level would just abruptly end as you walk through a door. And it was especially jarring because I played this version of the level before that. And it's like, I reach the point where I expect the level to keep going, and it just ends. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? I, I, what, what? I kind of find it fascinating, like, the, the, the order of events here, because normally the clock tower I associate with death 
in a way that you do the clock tower first and then you fight death and this is the opposite you fight death and then you go to yeah. the clock tower to rub it in yeah well not always in in chronicles it was that was fucking annoying kung fu werewolf um that, that, <laughs> god i remember yeah hold on <laughs> it was the kung, was a kung fu it, it was yeah, the, you, you, kung fu you even fight him yeah. on the clock face it was it was it was no, a, uh, it, uh, her, her her it's a girl it's a girl oh I remember that oh yeah uh, it's, it, it's a girl it was yeah. it was a girl yeah it was a, girl. It, it was it was a guy in rondo it was a girl in chronicles yeah ah uh, Oh, ow! <laughs> roll, roll, roll credits. <laughs> that is the canonical ending. I like how the bottomless pit isn't actually a bottomless pit. There, it's actually just got a floor that's too low for you to ever land on without dying. I wonder if anyone has ever glitched it so that they land on that floor and survive, and just soft lock themselves. So you you talking about glitching? I'm now just getting the idea. Because again, I'm 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 reminded of Mario 64 <laughs> uh, with the clock towers and just Reinhardt just backwards long jumping everywhere. It goes right to the throne room. Dracula in shambles. Wonder what the fuck he just saw. Speedrunning Reinhardt. <laughs> this level does have some Mario 64. Okay, so that jump that I just made, fucking impossible in the original game because <laughs> the the this room in the in the original clock tower stage had a fixed camera that glued itself to like the back corner of the room on the far fucking side and would only move ahead as you like approach the the second half of the room but it always stayed at this weird awkward angle where it kind of expects you to jump across the gears directly and like actually trying to jump and grab the ledge to, of of the door from where the key is found is annoying in fact, I can't think of any jump that you could possibly make from the place where you find that key that isn't really goddamn annoying because of the camera angle. It's just... This level feels unfinished in the original game. So what I'm hearing is Castlevania 64 has problems. Yes. And, you know, they fucking nuked one of those problems out of existence in this room. Because, okay, this room in the original was this big old... Was this big open rectangle of platforming challenges on both sides you would reach the door and then realize the door was locked so you would have to platform back down the platforms that you just platformed up and make your way all the way to the other side of the platforming room and find the key over there and then platform your way back no past me that didn't work ow my shins time to try it again and make sure it doesn't work <laughs> It amuses me that they that they added this big fucking hole in the middle of this room because it's like yeah we knew this platforming challenge was bad, so we fucking blew it up and installed a new one. It's great. It's like the <laughs> it's like it's like the opposite of what they did with the Tower of Execution. True, great. <laughs> this one has a USB C port. But yeah, um, this version of the clock tower is a lot easier. Unfortunately, it's also a lot slower, as you can see. There's a lot of waiting for platforms to move into position or Realizing that if you had moved a little faster, you could have grabbed that platform over there and going shit. And that because now you actually do have to wait for a platform that you really shouldn't have had to wait for. And, uh, but, yeah. good lord, that could have made this a little wider. They could have. Look at me being daring, not even waiting for the camera to move into position. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to see what I'm doing. Now, you may call this a display of skill. I call it, I'm fucking miserable and I want it to end. Well, if you just hold the grab button, you will grab any platform that is nearby you. It's not even, like, limited in the way Tomb Raider's ledge grab is, where you actually need to be facing the ledge. You can grab any ledge that you that you pass by, whether it's to the side or in front of you, and it will work. You'll just snap to the ledge and turn to it. It's actually really well implemented. Um... Although it does, although it does make, it does mean that certain jumps that you might try to make are um, a little trickier because if you hold the ledge grab button too soon, you'll grab onto the wrong ledge and it will be awkward. Like it won't actually mess you up, but it will slow you down. Why am I? Oh, oh, I don't. I, it's been so long since this first blind Reinhardt playthrough that I didn't, that I, that I actually like completely forgot how long I was stuck up here. <laughs> I didn't realize where I was supposed to go. I'd completely lost my bearings in the level, which is hilarious because I'm right o right above the door that I um that I um that I that I enter the room from. So I really just needed to drop down from the side. But I actually jumped back onto the onto the um Oh, please tell me that I didn't go all the way back. I hope I didn't go all the way back. 
Uh, do you remember old 3D games where you always had a look button and you had to look around the room to figure out what the fuck you were supposed to do? Whatever happened yeah, to that, man? Absolutely. Better uh, camera, camera design. design and level design got better, and we don't need them anymore. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, I wish. I, I, at the same time, I wish games still implemented look buttons so you could look around more freely, because sometimes these days it does feel a bit like you're at the mercy mercy of the game's camera and if the game's camera doesn't show you what you need to see then you're just not going to see it anyway yeah that was where i was supposed to go just drop down from the ledge boom easy i made that way harder for myself yeah i guess it, there's, there's no harm in just having it always available yeah it, it was just such a staple function of 3d games back in the day because every game had it every game needed it to function and uh Wait, what am I doing? What? Oh. <laughs> uh, you're doing a commentary over Castlevania Legacy. Of no, I realized I hadn't saved, so I'm like, oh, uh, I should go back and do that. I didn't realize that it was such a short walk from where I was to the next save point. So. Uh, yeah, I just need to walk over here, and here's another save point, obviously. Well, that made that, that, made that backtracking unnecessary, didn't it? That was me in a game I recently played, the Metroidvania, where it was like, okay, I beat a boss and I'm on low health. I better go back and save and get my health back and like, instead of trusting the game design to have a save point after the boss. <laughs> That's just being overly cautious, and I I, I, I I, find no harm in that. It, it, you Now you know in hindsight, oh, I can just continue going forward. To be fair, you know. I, since the Dominus collection came out recently, <laughs> I've actually found several situations where going back and saving after a boss fight is the winning move because they don't give you a save point after the fucking boss fight. Um, My so favorite thing about that collection coming out is that I've seen more than a handful of thumbnails over newcomers coming to the games and saying, yo, fuck this crab boss in Order of Ecclesia. And I was like, 2008, never let me be. <laughs> wait, 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 which crab boss? The crab boss you fight at uh, the elevator shaft at uh, Order oh. of Ecclesia, the one that you, uh, you're avoiding at first. Uh, and then you're, then you're slamming the whole fucking thing on him in a moment of satisfaction. Oh, yeah. Shinoa really has a thing out for that crowd too, because she says "go to hell." Like when she uh, activates the shaft, I was like, "Yeah, even fucking, even she hates this shit." <laughs> uh, now I'm remembering. Yeah, it's been so long since I played Order of Ecclesia through to completion that uh, I, I've, I've forgotten some of the moments that that really screwed with me. It's like Order of Ecclesia is one of those games where it's like some people think it's really easy because they figured out how to break the game on their first run, but me. On my first playthrough, my first blind playthrough, I wasn't looking for those game-breaking combinations. So when I got to Dracula, he fucking kicked my teeth in, <laughs> you know? Literally, because he actually moves and he can kick you. <laughs> <laughs> they designed that particular Dracula boss to be really challenging if you don't know what you're doing. And it's actually it actually woke me up to how hard some of the bosses that I previously thought of as easy could be if you didn't have something game-breaking with you. Because, like, I went back to Symphony of the Night. And I tried to actually fight Dracula without using the fucking Chrysogrim. And it's just like, yeah. no, don't do that. Fight him with the Chrysogrim. It's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> At most, I think the only thing you're really missing out in the second phase of Dracula and Symphony of the Night is that you get that, you get the kooky little animation of him summoning a familiar just to immediately kill it, uh, absorb its blood, and then charge up a super attack or some other shit. That's literally it. Thank God they put the key right next to the door in this version of the level. If you reach this door in the original version of the level, first of all, this is where the level would end, which is random as fuck. But also, the key was on, like, the opposite corner of the level. So you'd have to platform all the way back. It's... Oh, I hate that level. I'm never playing Castlevania 64 again, and it's not because Tower of Execution plays like shit, and it's not because the controls are a bit jank, it's because the clock tower fucking sucks, <laughs> and I don't want to deal with it right before Dracula. I keep reading that as Red Jewels, and not Red Jewel Small. Oh. I'm assuming that's what the S in parentheses stands for. Yes, the jewels only come. Okay. The, the jewels only come in two sizes: small, which is five, and large, which is ten. Which means you're fucking never running out of uh, out of hearts unless you're playing as Cornell. Um, and that only if you decide to use his werewolf form, 
which never fucking shuts off unless you're at zero hearts. Um, we'll talk about him in a couple parts. We'll be starting his playthrough next. But, yeah, y y there's an overabundance of hearts. You will never be out of ammunition for your sub-weapons. But who the fuck put that candle on top of the <laughs> clock hands? Like, who thought that was a good idea? Whose job is it to go out and light it every night? How does it still stay? I mean, I'm assuming the clock is functional. You know, in just an hour or two, that shit's going to be toppling over. Okay, look, look, that clock, it does not move unless you move it manually. And the reason being is that it's actually what you need to walk across to get over to get to Dracula's throne room. It's fucking weird. It's top tier of creature of chaos design, I must say. Um, that the, <laughs> the <laughs> that's your Yelp review of uh, Castlevania. The only means of accessing the castle keep is across the clock face. <laughs> um, man, and it, it, it's like one of the wackiest castle designs in terms of architecture, which is funny because the actual castle that you're going through is like Walter Bernhard castle tier levels of unremarkable from the outside. I don't know why, but the castle in both Castlevania 64 and Lament of Innocence is the most boring looking castle from the outside. It doesn't have any of the weird jutting towers and shit that you see in, in the other games. Eh. You can't even see the jutting tower with the, with the great staircase that, um, that Dracula's throne room is on until you're right up against it. You can't see it from the outside of the castle, it's just not built into the, uh, into the outside. I had a major fucking brain fart moment because like, okay, you know how old 3D games weren't designed to telegraph all the ledges that you could grab and stuff at you? Unless it's something specific like that one ledge that you have to shimmy across up there. But yeah. like in this case, like the ledge I'm supposed to grab is up there. I was looking directly at it a second ago. I, I just couldn't see it because I wasn't because I wasn't like really looking for it. I used to be so much better at picking that shit out of a 3D environment than I am now. But so many yeah. years of playing modern 3D games that make sure everything is painted a certain color for you has, has, has totally eroded that skill like from, from the surface of my brain. Is it a skill? Kind of is, yeah. I mean... It kind of goes back to the old Tomb Raider games where everything was designed along a grid. Oh, come on. Like, Tomb Raider is... Can I jump on this? Nope. Can I jump on this? Nope. Yeah. Can I hang on this? Nope. <laughs> uh, That's not skill. That's war of attrition. Until you get used to how the level com actually does communicate things to you. And even then, when you get to Tomb Raider 3, they fucking throw a bunch of ledges at you that look like they should be grabbable but aren't because the level designers are fucking cruel. <laughs> um, Schrodinger's ledge. But, like, the... The Tomb Raider level design was built along a specific set of grid pattern design, right? And after a while, you start to get used to seeing things in the environment that signal to your brain, oh, this is where I'm supposed to grab, grab here, slide here, backflip here, and side jump here. And it just starts to, like, really make sense in your brain. And... And, and then they release a remaster that gives you the option to play with analog controls, and it, it all just resets to zero, and you feel like a complete amateur again. Um, sorry. Bit of See, but I would argue <laughs> that if those ledges in question were marked clearly for you to interact with them, there's still the matter of having the dexterity and the platforming skill necessary to make that chain of sequences yeah. to get across. And that is a thing. You know? Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's kind of like where the Prince of Persia platforming design mentality went with it eventually they started like scratching up certain walls to say here r wall run here stupid and um and you know in a certain type of gameplay style not having to worry so much about communicating to the player where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do giving them clear telegraphs to instruct them on where the, the level design expects them to go it can keep the pace of that first playthrough up. At the same time, there, though, there is a certain, I want to say, gameplay feeling, a, a certain emotion tied to the necessity of pausing and looking around a 3D environment and trying to figure out what, what you're supposed to do and which direction you're even supposed to go that I feel 
is lacking in a lot of modern games. And I, 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 I wish... Not so much that it would come back in exactly the same form, but that designers would try to implement more of it in a more modernized form. Try and recapture some of that feeling. Although, to be fair, some games do sort of do, sort of get it right. Kind of. Needs more yellow paint. <laughs> <laughs> eh. It's so weird how many natural ledge formations grow into an it, it grow into a very specific shape and form in Horizon Zero Dawn. You know, you always but I'm know. I'm not gonna complain. You, <laughs> Here I go. You always know exactly where you can climb, <laughs> and it's just like ah. Uh, uh, I mean, I still like the game, but oh, I love I love Horizon Zero Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Horizon Zero Dawn. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to talk like I'm ragging on the game. It's just like, um, it came out at around the same time as Breath of the Wild, right? And it kind of just yeah, week, it same week, same week. Yeah, it kind of just highlighted to me. Oh, uh, hold that thought. This is like the one time we're jumping across moving platforms in this entire fucking game, and it's weird because it's the only time you get to you get to see that your momentum on a moving platform affects the length of your jump. Yeah, because you you overshot the previous one. Yeah, it, it caught me off guard, actually, because they don't do that anywhere. But it's like they have it programmed. It would have been cool to do that more often in platforming, but they just never do. It's weird. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, Horizon Zero Dawn. It came out at around the same time as Breath of the Wild, right? And, you know, I played both at around the same time because I got Breath of the Wild on the Wii U and everything. Thank you for releasing that on last-gen platforms, Nintendo. And I got to compare the feeling of both open-world games, and something that stuck with me the entire time was that in Horizon Zero Dawn, I felt like I was, like I was navigating through a series of very curated challenges. Ow! I just barely survived. What the? How are you not dead? <laughs> I have exactly 1% health. <laughs> um, and, and I felt like I was, I was navigating a series of curated linear challenges when I was playing Horizon Zero Dawn, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but... It did, but it did, but it, but it did give me a feeling of okay. I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing to get through this particular, this particular set, section of the world, right? There was no, there wasn't much discovery involved in figuring out my way around the land. I, I saw an area that I was supposed to. I almost fell. Uh, I, I saw an area that I was supposed to go through, and I saw immediately because the the uh, level design telegraphs itself so hard how I was supposed to approach it, and that's fine. You know, it it it, it kept the pace of my exploration up. But when I played Breath of the Wild, I often said nuts to the obvious path and found inventive ways to <laughs> climb my way around everything. <laughs> One of the first things I did after getting off the Great Plateau was climb that fucking mountain that you're supposed to ride under on your way to the first town, and um, oh, I, uh, I dual peaks. Yeah, dual peaks, and I cl I climbed up so many like uh, so many weird paths to get up there, and I hadn't even like discovered the magic that is Stam Stamella Shroom abuse to get my way up there. I found ways to like run in place on, on on inclines on halfway up the mountain so that I could restore my stamina and keep climbing. And it, 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 in places it was jank. In places it was like, I'm pretty sure the developers don't intend you to be able to do this. But the feeling of managing that style of exploration and succeeding in getting to where I was trying to go, there's just... It's... it's, 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 it's it's hard to describe. It's so breathtaking when you actually do it. And then you learn whistle pumping and it all becomes trivial. Hmm. I never had a reasonable casual playthrough. Though, to be yeah, fair. I know. I've, <laughs> I, I, I've never actually done that in any of my Breath of the Wild playthroughs. It just never seemed, you know, worth doing. Uh, that's not what it, for me personally, I wouldn't do it because that's not what like I'm not I'm not playing the game this big runner. Like I, I'm, I'm playing the game that take the taking the sights. Yeah, uh, and that sort of shit. Uh, so that's why I would. To me, it's not the same. It doesn't quite hit the same as like repeatedly side jumping, or Z locking and walking backwards because it's technically faster. <laughs> you know that sort of shit. 
It's like, no, it's like the, 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 the basic sprint is enough for me. It does have the same aura of disrespect, though. <laughs> yes, it does. 